clearly done. Now James talks about the perfect law of liberty. What does he mean? Go on to chapter 2, verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. So what's the perfect law of liberty? Loving your neighbor as yourself. It's also the royal law. And then in verse 12 of that chapter, it says, So speak and so act, those who will be judged of liberty. In other words, we will be judged by how much we've loved. And notice the beautiful words that he uses. He calls it the perfect law, the law of liberty, and the royal law. It's the perfect law because it includes all other law. It's the law of liberty because the person who truly loves is free to do whatever he wants. He's the only free person on earth today. If your heart is filled with and controlled by the love of God, everything you want to do is right. There's no law against you. And it's the royal law because you live like a king. But all that is impossible until we've been delivered from seeking to achieve righteousness by keeping the law of Moses or any other religious law. I smile at so-called evangelicals, fundamentalists, Pentecostals and others because they all say we're not under the law and nearly all of them substitute their own silly little laws. If the law of Moses could make people righteous, believe me, Baptist law will never make people righteous. Nor Pentecostal law, nor Presbyterian law, nor Catholic law. We are not made righteous by the keeping of a law. Now listen, that doesn't mean we can be lawless. If we be righteous by faith, we will keep the laws we ought to keep. You understand? That's the evidence. It's not the reason. It's not the cause. All right, if you understood what I'm telling you, and I mean, I'm sure you're moving that way, you'd get excited. I mean, really, when you once realize what it is to be free from the claims of the law, it's like a tremendous burden rolls off your shoulders. Thank God. Amen. All right, the third result of deliverance law as I describe it, is freedom to be led by the Holy Spirit. Paul said you are not under the law, but under grace. If you're under grace, led by the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to Romans 8 for a moment. Romans the 8th chapter, is 14 and 15. Romans 8, 14 and 15. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now that's a continuing present tense. As many as are regularly led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. To become a baby in God's family, you have to be born again the Spirit of God. To become a mature son, you have to be led by the Spirit of God. That only way to maturity. As many as are regularly led by the Spirit of God, these and only these, are sons of God. Now, then he goes on to say, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery again to fear. What is he talking about? Going back under the law. You've been made a son, don't become a slave. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery again to fear, but received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Bear in mind that these two mutually exclusive alternatives. You can live like a son or you can live like a slave, but you cannot be both at the same time. And then we turn in that context to Galatians 5 and verse 18. Galatians 5 and 18. But if you are led by the Spirit of God, you are not under the law. Now the only way to become a mature son of God is to be led by the Spirit of God. But if you're led by the Spirit of God, you are not under the law. So God's sons are not under the law. See, no matter what way you look at it, it comes up the same. Let me give you a simple example that's been vivid to me, and I hope I can make it clear to you. But the difference between being made righteous by keeping a law, 
and being made righteous by being led by the Holy Spirit. I compare them to two ways of finding your way to a certain destination. One way is a map, the other way is a personal guide. The map corresponds to what? The law. The guide is the Holy Spirit. All right. Now there's something in all unregenerate man that won't be independent of God. It's the result of the fall. You see, the motivation of the fall, the temptation of Satan, was not to do evil. It was to be in God. He said, you will be like God. Well, there's nothing wrong in being like God. The problem was they wanted to be like God without depending on God. The ultimate basic motivation of sin is not the desire to do evil. It's the desire to be independent of God. And wherever that desire comes in, sin works. So, here's this hale, healthy young man who's graduated from some university with some kind of a degree. He starts on life's course and he's presented with these alternatives. Do you want a map? Do you want a personal gun? Oh, he says, I understand maps. I have a degree in map reading. Give me the map. Sun is shining, the road is clear ahead of him, the birds are singing, he sets out. But 48 hours later, the situation has changed. It's the middle of the night, the howling storm, it's pitch dark, and he's on the edge of a precipice, and he doesn't know facing north, to the west. So he says, help. And a gentle voice says, can I help you? <laughs> and he says, oh, Holy Spirit, I need you. Thank you. Holy Spirit says, give me your hand, I'll get you out of this, I'll get you back on the right road. So a little while later, they're walking along on the road, and the sun is shining, the birds are singing, and the way is very clear ahead. And inwardly, he says to himself, I was dumb. Could have made it myself. I didn't really need so panicky. And as he says that, his guide disappears. <laughs> and there he is with the man. So he says, now I'm really make it this time. Well, about 40 hours later, he's in the middle of a swamp. And every step he takes, he sinks a little deeper. And, oh, God. <laughs> and that gentle voice says, do you need me? <laughs> he says, yes, thank you, came, Holy Spirit, I really need you. Need you. Give me your hand, I'll get you out. So there they are on the road again. Well, my question is, how many times does that have happened? You understand? How many times does the old, self-asserting, proud, carnal ego have to assert itself and say, I can make it without the Holy Spirit. I don't want to depend on anybody. I'm independent. I'm religious. I'm intelligent. That's the root problem of humanity. See? That's the problem that God has to deal with. If you analyze the course of your life, many of you will find out the thing God has been dealing with over the years is to get you to the point where you know you need God. And you know you need Him all the time. Well, we can picture the young man going on, we go just a little further. After a little while, he's diffidently to the Holy Spirit. He says, you know, I've got this map here. Would you like that? Maybe it would help you. The Holy Spirit said, no, thank you. I know the way. I've been this way many times before. Besides, he said, I made the map. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I don't know whether I've been able to help you, see? It's, it's a crucial issue for every Christian. The only way to achieve rightness and maturity is to be led by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is jealous. He will not share with the map. You trust the map, the Holy Spirit says, okay, I'll come back when you need me. <laughs> now, I don't say the map is meaningless. If you walk along with the Holy Spirit, he'll show you a lot of things on the map, but it'll never be a substitute for the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? Okay, so that's the second deliverance spoken of in Galatians. Deliverance from the law. I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. Why don't we say that? You say it after me. I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. All right, now we'll say it together this time. I, through the law, died.